Good morning, Southside Bible Church. Special welcome to anyone who is visiting with us this morning. We are grateful to have you uh, here with us at Southside Bible Church. Um, like to, as well as what Brian mentioned, um, Lisa and Michelle with their mother and the, the family. You, can you just raise your hand if you're a grandkid or anything in that family? Just so everyone, we have so many people in the church all united to this bunch, and they together just came and put Christ on display of his beauty and, and, his, and their mom, and it was just a, such a excellent time. And, and then the, the guys that played, um, I can only imagine, are they here? Those turkeys had me sobbing like a baby. It's such a good job. It was just beautiful. Well, it's good to be back. I was on uh, vacation for a couple weeks, and the Lord was kind to me in so many ways, refreshing my body and spirit till I got back to the smoke and you now have an infection in my throat and lungs. So the prayer this morning is that I get through this sermon. So if I start choking up, you start praying to the Lord, and we're going to all wrestle together in the, in the Word of God. So we are grateful for just your prayers and all that you did to help us refresh. The, there's one problem, though, it gave me two weeks to study and meditate and pray about the verse that we're going to look at this morning. And uh, I just, I'm so full. I could preach for months on this verse, and I, I don't want to overdo it. And so just pray for self-control uh, for your pastor. One afternoon, I was just laying in bed with four windows, and my backyard was the ocean. Uh, sea breeze just flowing in my room, and I'm reading this book by Martin Lloyd-Jones on the Spirit, and I I felt like I was in heaven itself with a joy inexpressible and full of glory, and I get to preach that to you this morning. So I'm asking for God to do that for you as well, because you don't need ocean views to get what I got. You just need the Holy Spirit to give you a view of Christ, for you to be overwhelmed with the love of God as his adopted children, uh, not under law, but under grace, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So that's my prayer um, for you all this morning. And so let's go to the Lord and we will ask him to meet us. Father, as I come before you, my heart is heavy for Afghanistan. God, I know you work all things according to your perfect will. And I remember years back, decades back, when planes flew into two towers and dropped them. And we sat and we heard as a nation. And from that, millions have come to faith in Jesus Christ that were Muslims before. And so, God, your ways are beyond our ways. And I pray that you will protect your people. Lord, the things we're hearing and that are going on there, we just pray, give them this supernatural strength. Holy Spirit, let them see their hope and the glory and the beauty of Christ to be unswerving. Meet them. As we think of, there's no pit so deep that you're not deeper still. Be with them. God, meet them. Let the gospel spread like wildfire in that country. God, let the world love refugees and all who are fleeing. Lord, we just cry out with hearts of love for those people. Be with them. God, I pray now as we open this word, such beauty before us, and I just pray that you would move mightily in your midst among every heart. Illuminate this word. Let everyone see it and understand it and rejoice. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Well, if you'll turn to Romans chapter 8, uh, we've been studying through this epistle, if you're visiting for quite a while. Um, as I've been doing kind of a bird's eye view of it all week, I've just been amazed again at Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation. And the first time I taught through this epistle was over 20 years ago, and I was hit so hard by Romans 1.18 through 3.20, and especially 3.9 through 18, where it's just this picture of, of my depravity. And I saw my own mugshot. There's none who understand, none who seek for God, none righteous, none good. And 
So you, you begin to realize that sin isn't just something you, you do, but it's this corruption that is inside of us because self rules and reigns, and we are defiled from our head down to our, our, our feet. And so I, I begin to realize that you can't pull yourself out of this wrath that's upon you because of sin. There's nothing human that can change your condition, change your nature, change your standing before God, and it just was brought home so heavy upon my own heart. <clears throat> the first time, the second time, <clears throat> well, I, <clears throat> sorry, I was undone, and I, I understood what Spurgeon or, or Bunyan, I can't remember which one it was, but he was walking down the street one day, and he walked by a bum, passed out in the street, and he said, if I could just trade hearts with him, I could be better off. And I was walking around feeling the same way as the Word of God was doing its work in my heart. The second time I taught through it, Romans 3 and 4 took on even a deeper place in my heart than before with the gospel of justification. I began to just fully understand that I'm not to be a working one to get this salvation, but Christ was the working one, and it's finished, and he accomplished it. And I come with no works. I come by faith and look to Christ alone and it was just overwhelming me and taking up my heart in a powerful way. But this time, <clears throat> the Spirit and His inner workings in the heart have really been overwhelming me. The ministry of regeneration, that He, he takes stony hearts and He gives us new ones, and now the Spirit of God comes to dwell within us as believers. And then this ministry of how He now um, brings us to faith, but transforms us and grows us and changes us. The Spirit doesn't just say, just say no to drugs. But He's a floodlight on Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and He shows you all that is yours by faith in Christ. And He just shows you and floodlights it through this Word and your heart is taken up. <clears throat> it's not done by fear. It's done by Abba. Father is the way He will grow and change you into His image. Holiness flows from the assurance and grace and security and the certainty of this gospel. That's how he gets holiness. Not from fear and insecurity and wavering and wondering and trying law and cleaning yourself up. That is not how God gets holiness. The new covenant is not a sword over your head, disobey and die, but a sword that was plunged through the heart of Jesus Christ then now you could be adopted into the family of God. He wants to assure you of His love. The Spirit sanctifies, and He does so by assuring us that these promises are mine. They're not other people's, they're, they're mine. And the Spirit of God, that's how He's going to grow us and transform us, is by you getting the certainty that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and nothing can separate me from his love. And I need that. Because as I look at this gospel, it's just so good. It's almost too good to be true. I mean, do you ever just marvel at the gospel and say, can this really be this good? I have a devil who cannot steal my salvation. So he will spend all of his time to steal my joy and my effectiveness and my witness by trying to get me to doubt and waver and be weak and struggle all of my days. There's a world <clears throat> that's been subjected to futility here in a few more verses. And as you look out, it's vain and it's empty and it's meaningless. And we're watching all the hopes in a world just crash the last couple of years. And you start to struggle with the futility of life and depression gets high. And there's a flesh that loves the scene, and it loves to solve my own problems by my own strength and not by Abba. And so this morning, we're going to see that there's a father that wants his children to know that he loves them. And he wants them to know that there is an inheritance laid up for them that is unimaginable. And he wants us to live in trust and confidence in him. And he wants us to live in assurance of these promises. So, he gives us Christ. A year and a half, we looked at the gospel. <clears throat> he gives us Jesus who came and died on a cross in our place and he lived the life that we should have. And he can make us right with him by faith. 
And so, guys, he gives us a gospel from cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation, looking at it from every angle that we would believe and have assurance. He gives us Romans 8, 1 through 4, that he takes us out from the rule of flesh and death, and now we're under the rule of the Spirit so that we can keep the requirement of the law. He gives us Romans 8, 12 <coughs> through 14, that we can put to death the deeds of the Spirit, of the deeds of the body by the Spirit. And the ones who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the ones who are sons of God. And he will bring assurance as you begin to see God killing sin in your life and destroying and beating things that you couldn't when you're an unbeliever. And you're starting to walk a path of holiness and he'll begin to assure you that the Spirit of God is dwelling in you. And then he gives you Abba, so that from the very core of your being, you cry out to God, Abba, Daddy, I know you. I've been reconciled to you. You're my Father. I look to you. I depend on you. There's intimacy. There's communion restored and bought in this gospel. There's a deep relational part to this gospel. And this morning... We're going to look at something so sweet, if I can get there. It feels like it's going backwards. I thought maybe it would warm up as I went. Where's Rick Hallahan? I, was, I, was, I texted him last night and said, my voice is bad. Brother, be ready just in case. And everyone else would have said, no way, there's not enough time to get ready. And he's like, done. This morning, he gives us the highest form of assurance there is. He he puts his own spirit within us, and he comes right in with our spirit, and he bears witness that we're children of God. Do you think God wants you to know what he has given to us in the gospel of Jesus Christ? He took an oath, I swear by God that I will accomplish my salvation. And he puts his spirit within you, Testify with your spirit that you're children of God. The Christian life is not to be lived in fear and worry, anxiety, all the things that encompass the American church. That is is the opposite of this gospel. It's to be lived in rock-solid confidence that I am his and he is mine. And hear me, this is ground zero for the Christian life. This is the battlefield. And this is why Paul has so many arguments and logic and persuasion. He's going to close the chapter with these bold proclamations against everything that will come against the assurance of his love for us. So let's take it up again. It's been three weeks. Uh, So we got to look at it. These points and these arguments are so linked that we're going to need some review And Mateo set me free last week because his introduction was longer than I've ever done. (laughs) It was beautiful. (laughs) But I feel free to take a long time this morning. And if I ever start feeling guilt again, I'm going to put Mateo up here again. So here's your outline. Paul's going to give us four ways the Holy Spirit shows us that we're children of God. And we saw last time in verse 14... <clears throat> for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. And you remember it starts with a four, and it's showing that we're not under obligation to the flesh any longer, but now we're putting to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. You'll live. And so those who are being led by the Spirit of God to do what? To put to death the deeds of the flesh. So those who the Spirit of God is leading you to kill sin and to starve it and to get to these roots and put them to death. These are the sons and daughters of God. He's going to assure you as as, as he leads you into holiness. The Holy Spirit is leading us to hate sin and to fight it and to battle. It doesn't say that you do it perfectly, but it says that you will fight. There's new life within you And the Spirit is leading you to fight sin. If you're here at peace with it and you've given up and you've caved in and you're drinking it like iniquity, like water, then then this morning you need the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Spirit leads you to war with what God hates. And that's sin. Second, he frees me. 
Verse 15. Children of God, you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you've received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. I'm no longer ruled by a ball and chain. There's not a law over me any longer that says do this and live, disobey and die. In Hebrews 8, it said, God says, they didn't keep my covenant, Israel, and I didn't care for them. I, I'm done. There's a performance. There's fear. No more living. I don't know if I'm a Christian. Up and down based on how well I did this day and how bad I did this day. It's done. I'm not under law. I'm not under that spirit of slavery any longer. I'm under grace. And Christ has done it all, and I am accepted by God. That's the opposite of slavish fear. Now my spirit says, Abba, Daddy, I draw near, I look to you, you're everything. I don't live under the fear of the sword any longer. I live as a child of God, adopted, and I cry, Abba, from the very core of my being, Daddy, my God. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how I'll put to death the deeds of the body of the Spirit. This is what the Spirit leads me in. Every sin is the opposite of Abba. Every sin is leading us to, to self-love, to security. It's leading us away from that. And, and when you get Abba, you can begin to fight sin in a whole new way and go after the core and the roots of why you're going after this sin. So if this is the key to holiness, to pleasing my Father, you can expect then that all hell is set against it. And so I need something really strong and bedrock to hold on to this. That this is mine through everything that comes upon it and the futility of this world and the depressions and the things that come at me. I need something bedrock to hold to this with all these things against me. Does God help his children in this? Well, he gives us something amazing to live into the confidence so that we can cry, Abba, Father. And that's our third point this morning. He assures me. He assures me in a way that is powerful. Verse 16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Guys, I don't know how to tell you this anymore as your pastor. So much is going to come against this. The hardest battle I've ever fought in my life is the fight of faith. To rest in Christ alone and stay there every day. That's the hardest battle I've ever fought for assurance. And if I gave you the list of all that has come against it in my life since I was saved, I could write volumes. The enemy has caused me to slip back under the law in my own thinking. You can't go back under the law in reality, but in my thinking, I've put myself back under thinking performance is how I get acceptance. I've had trials. When they're so hard, it feels like God's against me and left me. I have remaining sin where my reach always exceeds my grasp, where I want to be more holy than I am, and, and I come before God and I battle with that. I live in a world where I have to earn my love and my acceptance daily. And this free acceptance is so hard. Futility, where it seems like God is losing when you read about Afghanistan and all the things in this world. The sin that so easily entangles us is unbelief. How could God love me? I don't. I need something really strong to give me assurance. Rock solid assurance that causes me to stand against all of these things without fear that I'm a child of God and loved by him and accepted. And it needs to be something greater than me because I can't keep it. I can't hold on to it. I'm too weak. And so the answer is taking my heart away. God is so good to his children. <laughs> the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Is that not the goodness of God? I call this the highest form of assurance. The Wesleys, John and Charles, their father, 
wasn't saved till his old age, a few months before he died. And he talked about in this little paper he wrote, the inward testimony of the Spirit is the strongest proof of my hope of eternal life. This inner witness of the Holy Spirit bearing witness with mine that I'm a child of God. One of the great scholars of the last couple hundred years, Herman Bavinck, he said, the Holy Spirit is the great almighty witness of Christ who testifies of Christ in our hearts and brings us to the point of faith in his name and causes us to know the things which are given to us by God in Christ. But the Spirit of Christ at the same time causes us to know ourselves, not only in our guilt and our impurity, but also in our fellowship with Christ and our portion in him. After, after he has first convinced you <coughs> of sin and righteousness and judgment, and as the spirit of faith has worked faith in us, he follows up his work by assuring us of that faith. He becomes a spirit of adoption as children, a spirit which is suitable to children and lives in children, and one who makes us know that we are children. God gives us his spirit to assure us of all these promises that are yea and amen in Christ. And so I just want to give you a few building blocks as we begin this morning. And sorry, this sermon's taking longer because I usually get so excited I talk faster. And I just can't do it this morning. So I want you to hear this. Some of you need to hear this. Some of you already know this. Assurance is not what saves you. I want you to hear that. You're not saved by assurance. What saves you after a year and a half? You can yell it out if you want. (laughs) I hope you got it. Faith in Christ alone. We've been laboring hard in that doctrine and truth. You are justified by faith in Christ alone and the work of Christ alone. And this is the Spirit works in your life to bring you to this place to bring assurance. So your assurance does not justify you. It doesn't bring you to glory, but it makes the ride a lot sweeter. It brings heaven to your heart, and it brings power and witness. It puts to death the deeds of the, of the body, and I've watched that in this church. It empowers you to fight sin. And this assurance has degrees. It can come and go by sin, neglect, losing your first love, God's supernatural plan in your life. So my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. My assurance is not what saves me, my faith does. And so I want you to see that you can be justified and and lack assurance for different reasons, wrong thinking, sin that needs to be mortified, unbelief. But likewise, you can have great assurance and not be justified at all. Lloyd-Jones, I love what he said. He said, the devil will see to it that you doubt if you're a child of God, right? Because he wants to destroy your testimony and your witness. Why would he try to get an unbeliever to doubt? Then then they're going to get saved, right? So uh, an unbeliever, he's going to be attacking you and fighting your assurance. So I just want you to lay hold of that. You're going to have a fight in this. That's why this section is here and so important. And some today and throughout history have believed that assurance is wrong and something we shouldn't have. It'll make you haughty and make you not work for God. That's garbage. That's everything opposite of Romans. And some who live with it, and you're just comfortable. It's not important, just the facts, man. And what I want you to see this morning is that your Father in heaven, hear this word, desires, for you to have deep, deep assurance of his love and favorable purposes towards you. So much so, he's given you his word, and he's given you his spirit, and he's given you his son. He wants you to live bedrock, confident, on the promises of God are yours in Christ. He's made a covenant, and he's built it all on what he has done in his son. Tetelestai, it's finished, and you need to get it being under grace. In Romans chapter 8, no condemnation. What can separate you from his love? Nothing. That's what God desires for you, believing one. That's what he wants for you. 
So much so that he gave his spirit right inside of you to bear witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. And I want that powerfully for every child of God sitting here this morning. I've prayed for this for almost 23 years for everyone who attends this church. I'm a minister for your joy and joy is going to come through this assurance. And joy is to know that you're a child of God. That's my desire. I'm showing you what my heart is. The Holy Spirit, I'm praying, speak loud to the hearts of your people this morning. Let them hear. Let them hear with their spirit. And remove the stones and the weeds and the earwax that are blocking you from hearing the spirit. Replace unbelief with belief. Law thinking with the grace of God. And let this morning be the end of a horrific spiral. He loves me, he loves me not. I want that to end this morning, and I've been praying for that for so many. So let's look at verse 16. Is that long enough, Mateo? I love that, brother. The Spirit himself, the third person of the Trinity, God. He has come to take care of this great need of assurance. I need the, the gospel of Jesus Christ to be real to me. I need to know that it's mine. It must go beyond the academic. And I want you to notice the Spirit does this. Not a preacher, not your mother, not your friend, not a sermon. The Spirit himself has to bear witness with your spirit. God has given us some ways. He's given us promises that we're to believe in Romans 1 through 5. He's given us mortification by the Spirit. You'll live. If you're led by the Spirit, you'll be sons of God. But desiring even more to give you assurance, he sends his Spirit to testify with your spirit. So what does he do? He testifies with our spirit, our inner being. And so the question is, what is this? Well, the root word of this Greek word is maturia, and it's where we get the word witness. It's a legal term, and it's it's really the, the courtroom kind of stuff. And it meant then just simply a witness. And some of you younger people probably never saw it, but raise your hand if you ever saw Perry Mason. Okay, I'm going to go with the illustration. There's enough old people in here. I love it. <clears throat> Every time I got sick on Channel 2, man, in the afternoon was Perry Mason. I used to love it. And many times it, it would look like Perry Mason was about to lose a case. And, and the, the show is almost over. And the door of the courtroom would swing open and Paul Drake would come in and he found the witness that they were looking for the whole show. And this witness was always had the key testimony that when he would witness, it would just seal the case and D.A. Hamilton Berger knew he was done. Just, they lose. And in this case, the devil, with all of his accusations against you, they're done by the witness of the Holy Spirit who comes right into your heart and witnesses to you the love of God. God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And even my sins were forgiven. And I'm loved and I'm accepted and I'm adopted and God's working all things for my good and he's conforming me to Christ. I've met so many in my journey who are happy to leave the promises of God on the external and logical facts that never get into your heart and life. And this is why God gave you the Spirit. That's not what God wants for you. He wants so much more. We settle for mud puddles when you could have a day at the ocean, as Lewis said. What a gift. The Holy Spirit, I'm calling the key witness. Holy Spirit, come right into my heart. There's a trial going on and it looks like I'm going to lose because the devil is coming and saying, how can you be a child of God? And, and, and he shows me a whole lot of evidence and I got no argument. I'm losing. And the spirit bears witness with my spirit. He comes into my heart at the hour of crisis. We're children of God. And from our very depths, we cry, Abba, Father, How can it be? The answer is only Jesus. And I want you to get this. This is in the present active indicative. This is what the Spirit is doing. 
This is what he's doing all the time. It's a, it's a statement of fact. It's true. He's, he's testifying with our spirit that we're children of God. It's always happening. There are things that might make it faint and not so loud, <clears throat> like sin. And I think the sin of America is busyness. Hard to hear the spirit when you're so busy and your phone's in constantly noise. You're not going to hear a lot of this. Be still and know that I'm God. Lies from the devil, putting you back under law, unbelief. There are many things, though, that make it clearer called Holy Scriptures. I pray before I read these Scriptures, Holy Spirit, teach me. Make Jesus real to me. These words are children's bread. Let me eat them. Bear witness with my spirit that they're mine. And I mean this, this is so powerful. In Romans 5.5, 5, what did it say? Two years ago, God sheds abroad in our hearts the love of God in Christ Jesus. The infinite love of God, the Holy Spirit, sheds it abroad in your hearts. How much he loves you. And now in Romans 8.16, from the inside, he bears witness with our spirit. You got the outside coming in and the inside coming out. What more could you do? Isn't that beautiful? He's shedding it abroad and he's testifying inside. I'm a child of God. How much does he want you to live bedrock on these promises? To die on them? To live on them? He wants you to take it up with these things. Quit treat them like they're just some other fact. They're like encyclopedias. It's the Bible, the Word of God, God's Word to us. The Spirit's testifying of the love of God. And inside that I'm a child of God, Abba, Father, I'm encompassing you all around. That you would have assurance, confidence in this beautiful gospel. This verse is not very hard to exegete, but there's a lot of tricky pieces to it. It's hard to get because what I'm talking about is subjective. How many of you hate that? It makes your skin crawl. <laughs> I just like objective. <laughs> Give me my experiment. This is, this is subjective. The Spirit of God's coming into your heart testifying that you're a child of God. Can't exegete it. It's relational. It's heartfelt. It's adoption. And so I wanted to bring some testimony concerning it from the saints throughout history. I've been studying this for just weeks because I'm so intrigued by it. God shed some light in my heart on what this is. The Spirit's ministry of high assurance. This is the foundation of killing sin in your life. Full assurance. Don't run from it. And don't be content without it. This is what causes us to say, Abba, Father, I know that God is this to me. It's subjective from objective truths about Christ put in my heart. Thomas Schreiner, a commentator, said it's inevitable and mysterious. It's indescribable. Robert Haldane said it cannot be explained, but it's felt by the believer. The Holy Spirit is convincing us of our adoption. It's not a voice. It's not a vibration. It's not deduced in logic. It is spoken by the Spirit to our spirit that we're the sons of God and daughters. I was thinking through Philippians 4. Paul said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I think that's what's going on here. This is the Spirit taking the truth of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ to your very heart, saying, I'm a child of God within me. Daniel Wallace is one of the great Greek scholars of our time. And he said, I know I am a child of God, not just because the Bible tells me so, but because the Spirit convinces me it is so. Richard Sibbs was one of the great Puritan pastors and scholars. I was going to put all these up on the screen, but I forgot. So just track with me. <clears throat> Stay with me, my dear son. <clears throat> the immediate testimony of the Spirit is necessary for witness to the Father's love. It comes and it says, I am thy salvation. 
and our hearts are stirred up and comforted with joy inexpressible. This joy has degrees. Sometimes it comes so clear and strong that the soul questions not its state and grace ever again. In other cases, if we yield to any lust, there may be doubts. The Spirit does not always witness to us by force or argument from our sanctification, but directly by way of presence, as the sight of a friend's presence comforts us from speaking. <clears throat> there are other ways we'll be comforted by our sanctification. That's part of assurance. But this one is going right into our spirits bearing witness. William Guthrie says, I speak with the experience of many saints. And I hope according to the scriptures when I say that there is a communication of the spirit that is a glorious manifestation of God to the soul, shedding abroad God's love in our hearts. It's better felt than spoken of. It's not an audible, audible voice, but a ray of glory filling the soul with God and his life, love, and liberty. And Lloyd-Jones says, if you want to get a picture of what it is, picture this. A man walking down a road, a road holding his little boy's hand. The boy knows that this is his father and that he loves him. And then suddenly the father stops and lifts up the boy in his arms and embraces him and kisses him. And then he puts him down and they continue to walk. At that moment of embrace, the boy is no more a son than when he's being embraced than, than he was before. The father's action has not changed the relationship or the status, <clears throat> just the difference in enjoyment. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. And lastly, he rewards me in verse 17. I think three times it's not hard to get what he's getting at. If, and if children, heirs also, once, twice, heirs of God, and third time, fellow heirs with Christ. And we're going to unpack this a little more uh, next week. But I just want you to see that the Spirit bears witness, I'm a child of God. And if I'm a child of God, I get the inheritance. I get God as my inheritance. I get what Jesus gets. I'm a joint heir with Christ. And the Spirit bears witness, that's ours. And if you could see what's laid up for you and what you get, the things of earth are going to grow strangely dim instead of our hope and what I have to have. And so knowing I'm a child, I get the child's inheritance. Let the Spirit speak to what is laid up for you. Unbelievable. Everything that Christ inherited, he shares with his brothers and sisters. So let's close out. What, what do we do with this? I'll flip over to Acts 2. The Spirit of God bearing witness with our spirit. When we began Romans, um, my prayer was for revival. <clears throat> and I started asking myself, well, what would that look like? What was I really praying for? And, and this is it. That through the gospel, as we would stare at it as a church, week in and week out, that the Spirit would make it alive in your hearts. That as you look at the truth, and the Spirit testifies through that truth, that I'm a child of God, and you begin to see the beauty and the depth of this salvation, that it would just revive us. That we would marvel and be so taken up with this gospel that it de demands my life, my soul, my all. And, and as I was looking at what it would look like, I think Acts 2 is what I've been coming to. I think for the sake of time, go home on your own and read Acts 2. It's overwhelming. I'm just going to go to the, the last part of it in verse 37. The, the Spirit's poured out. They're now getting the fullness of this gospel, redemptive history that's all been pointing to Christ and uh, he, he, his body didn't undergo decay like David's. He's risen. He's, he's ruling and reigning. And now they're preaching this gospel. In verse 37, now when they heard this, <clears throat> these people were pierced to the heart with Peter's preaching. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
But the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Praise God for that. And and with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They just gave themselves to this constantly. Verse 43, they just kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. <clears throat> and all of those <clears throat> who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, this gospel, breaking bread from house to house, remembering Jesus Christ, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is my prayer for Southside Bible Church that this gospel would be so revived in our minds and hearts that it would be all that we're about and we just can't hear enough about it. Teaching, fellowshipping, breaking bread, giving our, our resources to help each other. We're just in this with one mind on this gospel. It's taken us up. We're just aliens and we belong to another country. That's what this gospel does. Second, why would Jesus say, it's better that I go away so I can send the the comforter? I mean, what, what could be better than having Jesus Christ standing there before you, teaching you and touching you and healing you? What could be better than that? Well, everything we're learning, the Spirit of God going inside and now dwelling within us, Christ dwelling within us now by his spirit. What could be better? I I commune with Christ. I don't have to go to Jerusalem any longer. I dwell with him like a vine and a branch. So it's great that he went away so that we could all have this intimate communion with Christ from the depth of our heart and our being. His spirit testifying with ours that we're children of God. It is good that he went away. And the Spirit has come to give you communion with Christ and to give you his fullness and his power and his intimacy. It is good that the Spirit went away. Third, what will be the fruit of this? God bears witness with my spirit. You know what happens? I mortify sin by the Spirit. When I know these promises are mine, I'm a child of God, nothing tempts me. (laughs) It just, boom. Boom. You're going to start putting to death the roots of sin and what's fighting you. And you're going to cry out, Abba. And you're going to have this intimacy with God. And you're going to keep the requirement of the law to love God and love others. That's what will come of this. Oh, how they love one another. Fourthly, do you see that your greatest need in your life this morning is Abba? All the things you're chasing, all the things you're running after and looking for that you think you got to have, your greatest need is just Abba, Father, Daddy, reconciled to God. <clears throat> Five, do you see the summary of the whole Bible? Spirit of slavery under law. You can't keep it. You can't get out from under it with all your workings and all it produced was fear and a fear of judgment. And now you're under the grace And God has done it all in Christ, and you have a spirit of adoption that says, Abba, Father. Here's the whole Bible. Six, do you see the seriousness of grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit? You know, it isn't just a little sin never hurt no one, is it? What I want you to see is all of this is the Spirit communicating this to your heart. And and grieving the Spirit hurts that communication and you hearing it. Sin's a big deal. It breaks this, it blocks it, it dams it up, it keeps you from hearing it. And so you begin to realize, uh, I don't want to grieve the Spirit of God, and therefore I'm going to repent and confess and keep walking in the Spirit. Number seven, the opposite of fear. I just watch our country collapsing in radical Islamic jihad and all that's going on in this world. 
And I just want you to hear this morning, the cure for every fear is Abba. I just want us to be a people in peace why everything's chaos around us and, and what you could be, what testimony is unbelievable. Abba, I got a pillow to put my head on that I'm a child of God. Number eight, don't live your life in a courtroom just sit running around saying, I'm justified. You've been justified so that you could be adopted. And I want you to live as the children of God. Number nine, I only got eight more. Just kidding. <laughs> May the power of the Spirit fall on Southside for deep cries from within my very soul, Abba, and that there would be mortification of sin in every heart. A people who are given to love God and love others and all will talk about your faith and your love and the world would hear this gospel. The other thing that hit me is under law, you can never have assurance. And that might be why you've lacked it your whole life, is you're still trying to perform to get favor with God and his acceptance. You will never find assurance when you're under the law. It can't happen. You can never do enough. Number 11, this day, may you be done with living at a distance from Christ. I just want external dead religion to die in this church. Do you want to live in the nearness of Abba, relationship, reconciled, saved, walking with God? Or do you want to just keep, you do your little religious duties, you do your outside things, and and there's none of what I'm talking about. You're looking at me going, I have no idea what you're talking about. For you, there's a gospel this morning to bring you near. This day, let's be done with living at a distance. And then last point, This one doesn't have a lot to do with it, but it's just my passion. I call this the ordinary work of the Spirit, and there's nothing ordinary about it. But I've just been looking so much at revivals. I've been reading about it for two weeks in my whole life since I've been saved. I've been taken up with these times where Spurgeon and Whitfield and Edwards and the Wesleys, there's just been these times in history of such great revival. And I just trace church history, and there's these times where the church is almost dying. They're becoming ineffective and dead and external. And all of a sudden, God will revive someone in the gospel again, and it will break out into churches or houses or sometimes countries. And it just brings it back to life, and you can trace it through church history. And I'm going to share with you just one that I read that was an interesting one in Ireland. I kind of like Ireland. I don't know why. I just like Ireland. I just want you to hear it, and we'll close. I'm going to share this one in 1857. There was a boy who was 12 years old, and I like it because it was a 12-year-old, and I want the young kids to see many revivals started with young children. And so I want you to not think, oh, I'm only 12 or something like that. God's not going to... God can change. You're going to see a whole country by a 12-year-old. And so I want you to hear that. Boy who's 12 years old, he's at school and he's really sad, and the teacher tries to help the lad. And the boy's wrestling with whether he was saved or not. And he's so down that he decided to just go home for the day, and the teacher was worried about him, so he assigned a student to walk home with him. Well, this student was a Christian. And as they walk, he explained the gospel to the boy on the way home, how Jesus had done it all, and you're not saved by your works, but by grace through faith. And this young boy was, was saved. He was led to Christ on their walk home. And he said, well, there's no need for me to go home. Let's go back to school. That's what happens when you get saved. (laughs) He comes into the schoolhouse and he tells the teacher, I'm okay. Jesus saved me. And he sits down and there's silence in the whole room. And the kids kept walking up to the teacher and said, I'm concerned about my soul. Can I go for a walk with that kid? And all the kids now are sitting down talking about Jesus, and they start praying together. And they're, they're, they're one by one starting to believe in Christ, and they send for the pastor of the town. And he comes, and he starts sharing, and the parents start coming, <clears throat> and all are sitting down, and they're praying as well. And, and they stayed there all night, with just many being saved. And the next day, they had a service, and the testimony of all the new believers. 
And the whole town came and the pastor preached and preached and no one would go home for two straight days. This went on for two years and a third of Ireland was saved. There are, there are seasons when the Holy Spirit will come upon a church, a region, a country. And I've never seen such an ineffective church in America. And my, my prayer is what I've learned is you can do nothing to cause that to happen. You can do nothing. The Spirit blows where He will and when. But as I look at America, I see one hope. And it's not getting a new president. It's in getting that. A third of this country falling on their faces and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what, what I'm praying is we, we've been looking at all the things that if the Spirit just makes real to my heart the beauty of this gospel and what it really is and be set free from this dying, passing away world, what would God do with Southside Bible Church and maybe South Denver and maybe even the whole country? And so I'm, I'm praying that the Spirit would blow and that this would happen. I'm seeing it happen and lives a little bit at a time. It's been amazing how many of you are beholding this. And I'm just, I want, I want, I just want more. I want more of us to, to get so lost in this that if I go over, none of you are offended. <laughs> let's, let's go for two days. Then, then we'll know something happened. If I go two minutes over, some of you are ready to cook my grits. So I just want you to, to hear what we studied in Sunday school and I'll close out. Ephesians 3, for this reason, Paul says, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth of and the length, and the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you might be filled up to all the fullness of God. I pray that for you this morning. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this glorious gospel. And I pray by your Spirit through these truths that we have been looking at, that you would strengthen us in our inner man, to know that they're ours. Assure us of a height and a depth and a breadth and a length that we could examine for years and marvel that nothing can get us out from under this love. <laughs> Thank you that you've plunged us into it by grace through faith in the work of Jesus Christ. And Thank you that there is all hell set against our assurance and you have put your own spirit within us to give us the highest form of assurance that I am a child of God. These promises are true. These promises are changing my life. And these promises are mine. Thank you for these three aspects of assurance. And I pray, God, I pray for every believing soul in this room. Give them that inner testimony. Let them slow down and, and hear and listen to this beautiful cry of the Spirit who's testifying in a present tense. And God, I pray for those who do not know Christ, those who still live in dead, formal religion, those who just walked in here wondering what this is all about. God, let them look to Jesus and call upon him even this hour to be saved to be saved, to be adopted into the family of God and to cry, Abba, Daddy, to have intimacy and, and to have a child's inheritance of a new heaven and a new earth with you forever. Oh God, overwhelm them. Let them come to Jesus and believe even this morning. So God, work in our midst. Assure deeply the children of God through the work of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.